Why do you think they, they think that they can get away with ignoring your rights, your constitutional rights, with this virus? Because I think it's the government, and the government can, they think they can do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, why could, they, why, why could they ignore the Constitution like they are? Why do they think they can get away with it? Because they're a bunch of crooks. Why do you think they're ignoring the Constitution? Because they want to replace it. <laughs> why do you think they feel they can get away with it? Because they think we're a bunch of sheet-minded morons that are just going to deal with it. I don't know. I just think I just think those that are pulling the strings and in charge, uh, it doesn't suit what they're trying to do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think they're trying to tear down the Constitution. Why do you think they they feel they can get away with ignoring your rights? Uh, money. Money. Yeah. Why is it that you think they can they can get away with it? I guess is a good question. They think they're above the law. They think they're above the law. Do you think they're above the law and they can manipulate the? rules to their blanket, you know what I mean? I agree. So yeah. they can have their way. Right. Right, you fill up their pockets, let's be honest. Yeah. You know, and control us, you know. Could you tell me why you believe they're ignoring our Constitution? I believe they're ignoring our Constitution. Um, I think it's a plan, honest to God. I, I think it's... Uh, I think it's a way to, you know, rig the election this year. Uh, I think this is all planned for the election year. Um, it just so happens that you know, there's some big names behind all this stuff, and you know, they're just they're doing anything they can to, you know, get get leverage on the average day American. Why do you think that they feel that they can get away with it? I mean, um, what what you think gives them the authority to, to just simply walk away from this Constitution on us? Power and control and. That's, that's about all I can come up with. Would, would you agree then that it's it's basically a matter of we no longer have enforcement power behind that constitution? What's that? Would you agree that it's a matter of how we no longer have power behind that or enforcement power behind that constitution? Yeah, I think it's all manipulation uh, to the average day American. We don't have a voice anymore. It's all about the upper, upper echelon of people. Uh, last question. What do you feel if we put the Bible in its place? Would we have enforcement power from God above? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not too big into you know reading the Bible, um, but from what you have said, um, I, I, I do believe that you know there is there is a way and a will to you know get back the the rights of the everyday people living by God's way. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Hello. Hey, Glenn. Hi, Ellie. Thanks a lot for calling in. Hey. Tell me something, if you would. Why do you think all the world's leaders are ignoring the world's constitutions? Well, it's pretty simple, Dwayne. Uh, what I think it is, is uh, they're setting up for the new world order. So they have to collapse every economy, every country, so that they can <clears throat> put in their agenda for the new world order. It may take a year or two before that gets done, but they have to start somewhere, so I think that's what's happening right now. And why do you think that they feel they can get away with it? Because they put the fear in the people. If you put the fear in the people, they can do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, there may be 10% of us, if that worldwide, that really are not afraid. But most of the majority of people are afraid, and so they'll do anything that they ask them to do. Okay. Now... Uh, one one last question for you. What do you think? Should we put the Bible in place as a new constitutional type document? Well, that would be great. <laughs> but it isn't going to happen until the Lord comes back. Uh, Ellie, what if I told you we could do that today? We don't have to wait until the Savior comes back. I believe he's waiting for us. The Puritans did that, and uh, they weren't waiting for the Savior. They just put it in place. Uh, the churches are all saying that so that we will sit back and wait for the Savior to come back rather than doing what we're called to do. And that's what churchianity is famous for, keeping people from thinking that it can happen now. The Puritans didn't have that problem. The Israelites didn't have that problem. And the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the Huruli, 
uh, the Visigoths that were in Euro the European theater throughout the Dark Ages. They didn't need to wait for the Messiah either. They had societies going by the Bible in their times. And, and most Americans have never heard any of this in their history classes and churches. I'm, I'm familiar with the Waldensies, yeah. They, nope. they had to actually flee in order to prevent from being killed. They lived in the mountains. Right, but if the whole world starts to wake up as we are now, see, that was just one area, and there was just one area being persecuted. Our whole world is being persecuted right now. It's the perfect opportunity, the perfect window of opportunity to tell the world, wake up, start reading your Bibles. It can be a perfect law book for us. And because of that, we're going to, I believe, see the Father come back to us in a way he has never come back on this planet before for those who are standing with him in this attitude that we are going to set up his kingdom waiting for the Messiah to come so that it's ready for him when he arrives. And all we got to do is escort him to his throne. Okay. Okay. And that's yeah, what... I agree with that. Okay. That's what I've been saying for 15 years now. And so the whole concept, again, is to try and get people out of that churchianity mindset that we have to wait for the Messiah to arrive. That's that's exactly what Rome taught. It came out of the Roman Jesuit Church and Churchianity teachings. Mm -hmm. that, that's what futurism was all created for, so that we yeah. will think nothing can happen yet. We might as well sit back and wait because we're going to be raptured away. And keeping us waiting and thinking that we have to wait is exactly what they want because they don't want us waking up and getting involved and trying to put a Bible in place and getting the Father's favor back now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, it does. So what we're trying to do, we've got a perfect window of opportunity. Everybody's waking up, and I've got tons of videos sitting here. From I got off YouTube, all kind of famous people saying they're not honoring our Constitution. They're they're disregarding the Constitution. They're, they're they're not paying attention to the Bill of Rights. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. The Second Amendment's being thrown out the window. Yeah, the reason for that is that that Constitution's unbiblical. It is, and um, you know, right now it's null and void, basically. Exactly. And that's why it's the perfect opportunity to tell everybody, now's the time. Let's get that Bible back in place like the Puritans had, and the Father will bless us left and right if enough of us do it. Now that all man-made laws are being totally ignored anyway, what do we have to lose? And if even just that 10% of us really put our hearts into gathering more of those who also see this with us, well, I believe the Father will then start opening more and more windows for us, and He'll protect those who are with Him. And that might be taking place right now with a few of us who are doing it. What's holding things back are the people who are saying, no, we have to wait for Christ. Well, that's Roman Catholic teaching. Because they don't want us stepping out of the boat first like Peter did. See, the Messiah couldn't rescue Peter until he first stepped out of the boat. That's right. Mm -hmm. So he had, to, he had to trust. Yeah. And that's what we have to do. We have to step out in faith come out of the beast system, uh, come out from among her that, that you touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. It says we have to step out first. There's four different places in Scripture talking about the end times where we're to come out from among them. But bottom line is we're to be encouraging people that the Bible should be, the literal Bible should be put in place as a law book. Go to Washington, take the glass cover off that ancient old document called the Constitution, Take it out and put the Bible in that glass case and put the lid back on and say, okay, now, Father, come on back down and help us. That's what I, I see that needs to happen. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. Okay. So now that I've gone through this, Ellie, tell me, down there in Arkansas, if you and a bunch of your friends were to hear me say, let's put the Bible in the place of the Constitution, what would you say? I would say, let's, let's go ahead and do it. Sounds like a good deal. All right, Ellie, thank you very much for being with us again. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Blessings to you. Bye-bye. If we had the Bible in place, don't you think the Father would enforce it for us and stop all this for us? Well, he would. Yeah? Yep, he would. He, you know, yeah, turn all the weapons into plowshares, and you're doing right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. Sure, no problem. I've got with me Walter Shue. Originally from Germany, now residing in Idaho, up there in Cora d'Alene, where they had the interesting Antifa showdown. Walter, how are you? I'm okay, yeah. Good to hear it. 
Walter, uh, I've got a lot of people uh, nationwide, well, actually worldwide, that are confronting me with how they're disappointed that the Constitution's failing them. And, well, how come they're not paying attention to our Constitution? Well, the Bible is the only answer. And uh, I'm trying to get as many voices as I can to help wake people up. And I'm hoping you have something refreshing to add to that. I do not know much about the Constitution. Uh -huh. I uh, know a little, but, but but not a lot, because coming from Germany, I uh, wasn't much involved. Mm -hmm. All I know is when I became a citizen that I studied something, because our Constitution is really the one uh, which the Creator has given us, because we have to accept the simple principle that the, the Creator, Yahweh Elohim, is the one that uh, has the, uh, let's see, He's in charge. He uh, he made the rules, and his law is supreme. Mm -hmm. so if it contradicts in any way, if any contradiction, any law of the land contradicts his law, his uh, Torah, then of course uh, uh, his will count. Yes. If uh, there's a conflict between man and his laws, he is he has the upper hand. He is the unquestionable authority. So uh, if the Constitution says anything that is against his uh, law, then he's in charge. Believers are to obey human law, except where that human law violates Yah's law. So our supreme duty is to obey Yahweh, since Yahweh tells us all to obey human law, he said that. We should. But when they come in conflict, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. We are to obey his law. Well, if I may here, Walter, let me ask you to back up just a little bit. And just like almost every American in this country right now who doesn't understand why our Constitution is being ignored. And every one of us is learning something new every day that's been hidden from us for a long time. So a lot of them will say what you just said, that the Constitution was given to us by our Creator. That, I believe, is where everyone's making their mistakes. That was fed to us by the mainstream media, by the twisted school systems that we were all fallen into, not just in America, but in other countries. And you also said that the Father's Law should be supreme. And you actually used the word supreme. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And because you spent your life in Germany, I know myself and all of our listeners are not going to blame you because many of them themselves don't know this that I'm going to say here about what the Constitution says about what is supreme and what's not. This is what the Constitution really says. Article 6 of the Constitution says, This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made of which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. What's that essentially say? It says, this Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. Not the Bible. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. In other words, the Constitution is the Bible of the corporate United States. And the Bible, since 1788, has been forced to take a second seat. That's that's completely conflicting. Well, that is the problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's just yeah. one eyesore. There's several others that are in conflict with the Father's Law system, which make the Constitution, in my opinion, a document of blasphemy against my God. Yeah, but uh, but but that's the same with, with, with any Constitution of any country. That's right. It's not just here. It's, it's in any country, the same in Germany where we come from, because they're making laws which are in contradiction to what the, what, what the uh, law of Yahweh said. Yep, exactly. That, that's the problem, because there have, laws have been uh, passed which are in contradiction, in violation. So they're wrong. Those who uh, want to do away with God's laws, they possess the anti-Messiah spirit. No one can be above Torah. That's right. Above his law, his instruction. Because being above Yahweh's law means to be above Yahweh. Well said. 
and uh, his law or his Torah, which we like to say, or uh, his instruction are just a reflection of the lawgiver. And when men uh, uh, change his law, that's what they do with some of the men's law. Then they're in trouble, and someday they will be accountable. And it's going to happen, and it's going to happen soon. Absolutely. One, one thing that I like to mention is what you have to remember. When we make laws, or when we are without God's instruction, uh -huh. that leads to paganism and idolatry. And that's what happened. Yes. The, the reason a man has made laws which are in contradiction to the law of uh, the Creator, that's why they are uh, have been led into paganism and idolatry. That's right. They're created in the first place because people don't want to go by the Father's laws. They want to transgress into sins of their own choice. Right, right. Yeah. Being without God's law is like a fish without water. That's a good way to say it, yeah. I agree. You know. So anyhow, my 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 thing is that uh, his law is eternal. Man's law is not eternal, and uh, his law cannot be changed. It cannot be improved. And uh, his law is higher than man's laws. And he wants his people to obey him. He is the, he's the one that created us. He's the one that made us. He's the one that gives us air. He uh, makes our heart pump, so he's in charge. He holds all rulers in all nations, including non-believers, accountable to his instruction that he gave at Sinai or, uh, you know, the unbelievers are not free to do what they want because they will be judged someday by his law. And that's the only law that we are accountable 100%. And he will judge all the people by that law that he made at Sinai. And they don't belong just to the Jews, they belong to all people. Hallelujah. You know? Yeah. I'm real impressed. All right, so all the way from Germany, folks, you heard it. It's real simple. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be a law expert. All you have to understand is that the Father himself writes better laws. He's more loving. He's more fair. He's more just. He's more intelligent than any law-writing legislator on the planet. Mm -hmm. That's the reason we, as people, as his people, are to meditate on Torah, on his law, look at, the, at his law, speak of his law, listen to his law, walk in his law, seek his Torah, and delight in his law, and have it in our heart. Hallelujah. And there is liberty in his law. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then Yeshua, our Savior, he is a living Torah. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hallelujah. And he also said that it's not his separate law from the Father, but he also said that when he comes, he's going to join up with those, the saints, who have the Father's law, Father's name in their foreheads. So right. Right. He is a, the son is a, an ambassador for the father's law system. He didn't bring his own new simpler law system. Mm -hmm. the, the problem also is that uh, people they they fall for the law of men for for, for the laws of men because they don't know what the other's law says. Yeah. Because we need to know what it says. We need to know what it states so we know when a law comes that is different. So we know that it's wrong. Without the Torah's guidance and direction, we would be lost in the stormy seas of confusion. Yeah. Without a spiritual guidance system, we flounder about wandering aimlessly through life. We will take anything what comes our way. Within the Torah lifestyle, there is still ample room for spontaneity and freedom of expression. His law is fair, his law is right, and uh, that's what you want to follow. The perfect law of liberty, right. Yeah, and it's the way, the truth, and the life. Absolutely. And it's simple, too. Yes, it is. When people look at the Torah, at the instruction of the Bible, it has like 613 different laws, but mm. they are, you, you know, we don't need all of those anymore because we don't live in the country, we don't have the Levitical system. Some are applied to the priest, some are applied to 
uh, men, some apply to women. But his laws are very simple. We are to love uh, him with all our heart and our neighbor as ourselves. And love is the fulfilling of that law. That's right. That's the fulfilling, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and then the other thing is we have to remember that the Creator's law is eternal. It will never change. Yeah. Because he says in, uh, in uh, let's see, what is this, in uh, Malachi 3, 6, I am Yahweh and I change not, period. That's right. So he's not changing it all the time. He's, he's not changing. Man's laws are changing all, all the time. You know, uh, just one, one generation later, they uh, change things. Look what's happening today. Wear a mask today, don't wear one tomorrow. Eat in a restaurant today, don't eat in a restaurant tomorrow. You know, talk about change. Right, right. And that's from state to state, city to city. Who knows? What's, it's, it's, they do that on purpose. Yeah. They, they yeah, want us yeah, well, in chaos. The reason being is because Satan is behind it. That's right. He's the master of chaos. And he's a liar from the beginning, Amen. according to John eight forty four. Hallelujah, I agree. Well, Walter, I promised I'd keep you short. It's been a real delight having you on with us again. I appreciate your time. Not a problem at all. Well, you take care, and God bless you. Yahweh bless you too, my friend. Bye-bye. Why do you think that they're ignoring our constitutional rights? Why do I think they're ignoring our constitutional rights? Uh, Because they want us to go by a different set of laws. Okay. Why do you think that they think they can get away with it? Because we're being dumbed down and we're just learning to be a part of the mass instead of our own person. Uh-huh. You think it might have something to do with enforcement power and there's the fact that we're not going by God's laws for him to enforce it? Absolutely. Okay. What do you think about putting the Bible in the place of the Constitution in America? I think we'd have a lot more happy people that were more friendly and kind to each other. So I think it'd be a great thing. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. For sure. What do you think about the idea of replacing the Constitution with the literal Bible? Well, that book, the Bible, has been proven accurate more and more and more and more. And on top of it, it is straight, justifiable law. There is no one that comes away from being judged under that law that feels cheated. There's no way for them to feel like they were taken advantage of. And um, each, every person that would have a grievance would be satisfied. And I don't expect that that works this way with the current government. Good answer. I like that. I thank you very much, Steve. All right. You have yourself a good day. And thank you. Bye-bye. Who'd like to hop in next? Hi, this is Jackie from California, and I think we need to replace the Constitution with the Bible. That's good. I like to hear that. Yes, and with the word of the King of Kings, not man. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jackie. Oh, bless you. And bless you, my dear. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Hello, who do we have here? Go ahead, chime in. This is Kevin from Pennsylvania, and I feel the difference between constitutional law and biblical law. With the constitutional law, it puts man first. Men and women of power dictating to the masses what is best for them. Biblical law puts God first. And when we put God first, everything else will fall in place. The country today is run by power-hungry politicians. Say they are working for you when in reality they're trying to control you and I for their benefit. They're pitting man against man to create civil unrest. They're tying the hands of our police along with our citizens. We're being told where we can go and how many of us can go there. We are forced to wait in line. Told what businesses are essential and which ones are not. Our places of worship have been shut down. Fear is used to control our lives. It's time to take back our country in Yahweh's name and use the Bible as it was intended. The Constitution was written over 200 years ago with we, the people, and to whom it would serve and glorify. The Bible is thousands of years old and is for the glory of God. Wow. Thanks, Kevin. That was wonderful. We need more voices like that out there. 
So we're going to get all of your better voices out there into the world so that you guys can be a great inspiration that, yes, there are a lot of people that want to see this happen. And maybe we can stop this mess before it gets much worse. When I find myself in times of trouble, the word may flesh just come to me. The shoes, words of wisdom, he's my key. And in these times of darkness, he is walking there in front of me, leading us in wisdom as our key. And we have Ted Wyland, our old good friend on the line here again with us. Ted, good to have you with us again. Yeah, thank you, Dwayne. Appreciate being here. Hey, buddy, listen, you know that we're seeing everywhere the Constitution in America and in every country around the world, they seem to be getting ignored. And lots of people are realizing that now. Uh, I, I don't think we need to prove it to people anymore that our man-made law documents, no matter how well they're worded, are never able to withstand the wickedness of tyranny. Never. I mean, none throughout history. So what good is a law system that has no enforcement power behind it? And I want to play a clip for you, Ted, before we start. This is a fellow who's gaining a lot of popularity lately with his truth of the COVID-19 situation who at the same time doesn't quite know where to go. Him and a lot of people around the world, what do we do? The constitutions are falling apart. But here's that clip, Ted. These are just pieces of paper that are used as essentially instruments to, to be wielded as necessary for political purposes and completely dis discarded or disregarded when it is no, not, not in the interests of the power structure to, to, to abide by it. What do you think there, Ted? Uh, well, you know... We're looking at a, a, of course, when we're looking at America and a, a particular, well, let me say the United States of America, uh, which is a different entity completely from America, and, and that probably needs to first be understood, America being what existed in the early 1600s, uh, under which the Puritans established governments of, by, and for God, expressly established upon the Bible triune moral law that the Ten Commandments, their statutes and judgments, uh, as compared to what was created as the United States of America, also known as the Constitutional Republic, in, uh, beginning in 1787 with the Philadelphia Convention. Two different entities completely. And the thing that came to mind, both with what you just played, as well as your opening remarks there, Dwayne, was... Uh, the, the terminology, or at least one of the things that we hear all the time, the Constitution, um, the founding document of the United States of America, or the Constitutional Republic, the, one of the descriptive terms that's often used for that document is uh, the grand experiment in self-government. And uh, lately I've, I've been responding to that, and, and with self-government, what could go wrong? Uh, maybe everything? <laughs> everything is the answer, of course. Everything could go, go, go wrong, because self-government is just a fancy cover for what otherwise is known as secular humanism. And uh, secular humanism, regardless the form of government in which it manifests itself, is always destined for failure. I mean, it's, it's government of, by, and for the people, rather than, or juxtaposed with government of, by, and for God, um, as it goes for the Constitution or the Constitutional Republic, it was therefore destined to fall from its very inception, and you can prove it by two scriptures alone, Matthew chapter 7, I think it's 26 and 27, where it describes um, anything built upon sand that is not upon the rock, upon the Word of God and His laws is destined to fall, and great will be the fall thereof. And then you've also got uh, Matthew chapter 12, I believe it's verse 25, where it talks about a house divided against itself shall not stand. Well, this house, known as the Constitutional Republic, has been divided against itself from its very inception, mm -hmm. and how much more so now? Yeah. Uh, like, I mean, we've seen it divided, but nothing like what we're seeing now. It is at war with itself, 
and it is dest- it was destined to fall from its very inception, and it's even become more clear that that's exactly what's happening. You know, with all this craziness, this insanity that's going on with this COVID-19 uh, uh, situation and and uh, Black Lives Matter and, and uh, these other things that are happening around us, of course, it's all according to God. He's sovereign. Everything goes wrong just right. This has mm-hmm. to happen in order for one day this uh, secular constitutional republic and all that it represents today for it to fall and for one day hopefully our posterity to be prepared to uh, to build upon its ruins with what was the government of by and for god originally established by many of the puritans in the early 1600s mm. and uh so we see it around us. God is certainly at work, and he's behind what's going on. I keep thinking of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God confounding the quote-unquote wisdom of the world. Well, it's not even, it's not even described as wisdom. It's compounded insanity that God has confounded. Um, he's confounded them, and they are doing some of the stupidest things. I mean, I'm sitting here scratching my head. How can you be so stupid until I realize that God is at work? And we have uh, so much to uh, to look forward to, because this is the beginning of the birth bang of something that is going to be so great. We live, Dwayne, as I think you and I have shared in the past, we live in what I believe is the most exciting paradigm shift in American history. More exciting than when the Pur- Pilgrims and Puritans came to America to establish government of, by, and God. We get to see the government of, by, and for the people torn down by God. And then he allows us to hopefully to have our what we should have uh, ready to go in place a government of by and for him, and if not for us, then for our posterity. Anymore, I'm thinking it may be something we get to see after God judges this nation, brings it to His feet um, in either obedience or judgment, and then we get to take it from there. So I'm I'm looking forward to whatever God has in mind as this thing plays out. Yeah, and the day that we're all looking forward to, the day that the saints inherit the kingdoms of the earth. And I have so many people, so many folks, that are simply just terrified. I mean, I I can't put a bigger word on it. It, They're having trouble sleeping at nights in the whole nine yards. It's amplifying their, their fears. It's amplifying their stress. Their immune systems are down, so they feel sick. What I've been saying to a lot of people is if you're not scared enough to actually want that biblical government in place, then it has to get worse. What would you say to that? Well, I think it's going to get worse. I don't. I don't think there's any question. We've only begun to see how uh, things fall apart, and and it certainly is compounded in the last ten years, and and particularly this year, we've seen things compounded in a way that I'm sure neither you nor I um, ever believed that we would we would see um, transpire. But it's the worst. You know, this nation, uh, it's my opinion, you know, God, God's going to do what God's going to do to accomplish his, his sovereign will and purpose, regardless what we may think or how we think it's going to happen. But uh, it, in my opinion, I believe that this is going to be a multifaceted judgment upon this nation that we've only just begun to see. And it's the only thing that's going to bring this nation to its knees before it's God. And again, whether in obedience or under judgment, um, and I suspect it's going to, you know, COVID-19 is a joke. What God has in mind when it comes to that kind of thing, amongst other things, economic destruction, uh, probably infiltration by uh, other nations, um, uh, natural catastrophes. When God finally decides to judge this nation, to bring it to his knees, and remember, those who are fearing need to fear Yahweh and know that everything goes wrong just right. This is playing out perfectly. There's nothing to fear. God is in control. The giants in this land, you know, are no different than those described by Isaiah and where he talked about the inhabitants of the entire world are grasshoppers. Mm-hmm. You know, when the, when the, uh, the ten spies came back with the bad report out of the land of Canaan that there were giants in the land and that they saw themselves like like grasshoppers, and so did the giants, therefore. We empower the giants, by the way, with our own pessimistic outlook upon uh, really not 
not ourselves, but our God, that our God is greater than all of the grasshoppers. And what the, what the Israelites of old were facing was just, an, just a larger form of grasshoppers. Yeah. Instead, they look looking from below. They look like giants instead of looking at a giant of a god who, who's got this all in control, taken care of. We really should be excited rather than fear, fearful because we're seeing God's hand played out before us on a daily basis right now. Absolutely. And again, back to the enforcement issue. As soon as we do find his mercy again, for ourselves, if we're still around, or our posterity, the enforcement power behind that is going to be of biblical proportions, just to use that phrase. And there'd be nothing to fear at that point. So the sooner everybody gets on their knees, repents, reforms their lives, and starts accepting this, and starts to help us do that exactly what we've all been called to do, which is to pray, Thy kingdom come, your government come, Father, on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done, your laws be done your whole system of moral justice, that it comes to this earth as it should be. The sooner this happens, the sooner we can start to rest. And I am trying so hard to put this out there to people one-on-one. -on -one. They're, they're censoring the net. Ted, you and I are having a lot of trouble getting an audience out there nowadays. Of course, they're not going to allow us on Hannity's show or somebody else like that. So we have to be very instrumental in following the Great Commission, getting out there, all of us, men, women, and witnessing to the world of uh, this whole concept of a biblical government built on love. Amen. And and we need to understand, you know, let me add to, particularly for those who, who, who are seeing giants in the land instead of a giant of a god, let me just summarize it that way, that we need to understand, you know, we're going to suffer. Um, the remnant's going to suffer, um, but it's all a part of the process. And I keep telling people, you know, the prayer we probably should be praying is Habakkuk's prayer in, in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 1, where he said, Oh Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. Mm -hmm. um, and he will. He will. And then that same chapter in this fashion, and I love this part of the Bible. I, I love the entire Bible, but this is one of those special parts for me, where it says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, mm -hmm. neither shall the fruit be in the vine, the labor of the olives shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in Yahweh. I will join in the God of my salvation. Yahweh God is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. Um, that's the outlook we need to have, regardless what we have to go through in order to get to where we need to go. A paradigm shift is never easy. But it can sure be exciting, and we, especially when you understand who's in control of this, our sovereign God, with whom everything goes wrong just right. Hallelujah. Ted, I thank you very much. I promise I'd keep this short for you. I know you're tired at the end of the day for you, and you're getting a lot of uh, calls to do a lot of other interviews. Uh, I thank you for stopping by again, and I just hope that we can turn enough people around that the Father will start smiling down upon us here soon. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Dwayne, for having me share this time with you. And I thank you, Ted. Blessings, buddy. Thanks. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So let's go over a few things that we weren't told by mainstream media, our schools, our churches, just to give you folks a few more tidbits of things that may have never crossed your mind before in the ways of research and facts. For starters, back in 2005, there was a quiet little news gathering where there was a press conference in the Oval Office and George W. Bush was getting hammered by a lot of the people in that press conference about how the Patriot Act was destroying a lot of our constitutional rights. What was getting him upset, and as some of you know, George Bush wasn't one to keep his calm. At one point he said, quote, Stop throwing the Constitution in my face. It's just a, excuse me here, it's just a goddamn piece of paper, unquote, he said. Folks, that's exactly right. Just as we've heard James Corbett say, it's just a piece of paper. There's no enforcement power behind it. There's no God standing behind it saying, don't mess with my people. But, in today's world, he can't officially claim us as his people because we're standing in two jurisdictions at once. We're claiming with our lips that we're a part of Christ's kingdom. We respect the Bible and its laws. 
And on the other hand, with our works, we're officially signed in, sworn in by signature, that we're in Satan's jurisdiction in an imaginary neutral or secular world called the United States of America. Now, this is where Ted touched on a moment ago. So let me explain to you. The original America, and regardless of the controversies over the actual name of America, even so, we were in this nation, meaning the Christian colonists, beginning in 1620, following the Bible. And we began this nation based on that Bible as our law book, claiming this land for that kingdom. But of course, there was another entity that claimed this land for another empire or kingdom which was Christopher Columbus when he planted the flag here and we were taught that in our history books that he discovered America in 1492 it had no significance at all to us in this time and age except that it points out that Christopher Columbus had a document given to him by the King and Queen of Castile who at the time were the beginning of the Spanish crown now the Spanish crown was not Spanish to begin with just like the British crown it was a franchise of Rome. If you read the document that Christopher Columbus was given in order to go discover America, of course, he didn't discover anything. The Vikings and, and South Africans and people from all over the world had been there centuries before that. They said he discovered it for the Spanish crown. Well, people would have been upset if it had discovered it for Rome, so they had to give it a cover franchise. So he went over there with a document that said, you will be given admiralty jurisdiction over this land that you shall discover. I'm paraphrasing. We have that on some of our older videos. Which did what to America? Even before the settlers started landing there. It tried to claim this new continent under the jurisdiction of Rome and its maritime or Admiralty Jurisdictional Courts, which is a part of this Freemasonry issue that you also have to see evidence of in a video called Hidden Faith of the Founding Fathers by Christian Pinto. You've got to check that video out. It's an excellent documentary on how the Founding Fathers weren't believers. They weren't Christians after all. It even exposes David Barton as to how he twists all kinds of things around and does all kind of word manipulation acrobatics to get you to believe that it wasn't the Puritans that landed here on the Mayflower at Plymouth Rock that are our true founding fathers, but the men who eventually wrote the Constitution in secret, put it in place, and had even laid out Washington, D.C. in a very strange and Masonic way, that they are our founding fathers. They are the ones we should look up to as our heroes of true Christianity. Even though there's pagan images and statues all over Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. was donated to be sort of a city-state inside of a country. Just like the Vatican is a city-state inside of a country. There's actually two different kingdoms trying to exist in the same space. Sort of like two different families feuding inside the same house. There's the original America that we as Christians were claiming for the Father. And, of course, there's this United States of America... It's a corporation, and we've gone over the word corporation a while back, and you know what that all stands for. It's a business, not a kingdom. And it's all set up on equity, money, greed, power, lust, call it what you will, everything that fits but love. The original America under the Puritans was founded on the precepts of the Bible which teach love. It teaches us how not to hurt one another and how to love one another. And we can do that in the open. And are not ashamed of it. Well, at least not until lately. There's a lot of Christians that seem to be ashamed of that Bible today. But for the most part, there's two Americas. And this is why the Constitution was written. The Constitution was written to slowly draw us away from the God of the Bible and all of the laws that that Bible stands for. So that they could get that pesky God off of their backs that always pummels tyrants for those who are faithful to him love him, love his laws, and obey them. Well, here we are in our time. The Constitution has done its job for the Satanists, the Luciferians, the Freemasons. The Constitution now has outlived its usefulness. 
because they now have us back in their clutches after we had escaped from Europe hundreds of years ago. They think they have complete control, but folks, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. And these coincidentally named gates of hell agents, both mortal and spiritual, are getting desperate as they know we are waking up a lot faster than they expected. So they're wickedly increasing their satanic devotions and sacrifices, trying to please their god, Satan, where they're actually fulfilling prophecy, just as it's written, folks. They worshipped the dragon, which is Satan, which gave power under the beast, which is this whole artificial intelligence-guided New World Order death machine, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Revelation 13.4 So yeah, who can defeat this thing coming down upon us? No one, folks, because it's being sent as a punishment upon a massively sinful world. And so just as I've been asking the question for about 12 years now on my website, how do you stop a wrath of Yahweh with man-made solutions. You don't. Plain and simple. No politician can stop it. No government. No man-made constitution can do anything but make this unbelievably patient God even angrier in this generation of billions who yet, even in the face of this beast, under all the things we're facing, refuse to reform and bend their knee to him just yet where it'll surely have to get much worse before it gets better. I'm prepared to see that through, because I'm standing with him. How about you folks? Some of you, therefore, who are counting on others to do all the reforming and bringing this Almighty God back to our side, are actually a part of the problem, not the solution. Reforming our lives and our nation to biblical law is the solution, my friends, the only solution. Yahweh, the God of the Bible, is the only one that can make war with this beast. And we're not going to gain his help if we continue to snub our noses at his law, his instruction, and his grace for us. So here's a summary of our video in a way that I've been describing it to people on the street, people on their porches, people on street corners. People came flocking here to America because you weren't allowed to read your Bibles in your own language in both the Roman territories and the English Anglican territories when rulers like Bloody Mary were in charge. So they were flocking to America so they could be at true freedom under the perfect law of liberty, biblical governance. When they first landed in 1620, the Mayflower Compact was written, actually a week before they landed, they agreed they were going to go by the Bible as their law book to govern themselves with. And many of the colonies continued that tradition for generations, 150 years before the Constitution was put in place, which, again, in Article 6, says it is the supreme law of the land. By then, a lot of people were here, either being complacent Christians at that time, having gotten settled in and too comfy, and or a lot of secular people that were shipped over here intentionally to infiltrate us, where, again, the Constitutional Convention was held in secret. George Washington was given the minutes of those meetings, and they were never to this day released. If you want to see that information, that's in a book by Gary North called Conspiracy in Philadelphia, which you can't buy hard copies of anymore. And I don't know that I could trust the digital ones online. But that's a good book. And of course, as always, you can go to Ted Weiland's research material as well. And there's many other guys around the nation that have evidences for this. When the Constitutional Convention was being held, it was being held on the second floor of a building where they knew snoopers couldn't listen in. Why? Why all the secrecy? Why were the minutes never released? Because it was a coup. It was designed to get a constitution in place that would replace biblical law in America. When the constitution then was ratified by the states in 1788, I believe the father, in an imaginary way in my heart, sat back and said, oh, okay, I had given each of you a free will. 
as individuals, as gatherings of ecclesias, and as a nation. You've been given a free will to either go by my laws that teach you how not to hurt one another and at the same time how to love one another. But because I gave you a free will, I have to stay out of this arrangement just as the prodigal son story explains. And here's how that works. You see, the prodigal son, for those of you that know that story, obviously became of age, told his father he wanted his inheritance. He was going to go see the world, basically, right? The father surely didn't like the idea, but because the son was of age, he gave him his inheritance, probably gave him a blessing, gave him a hug, told him I love you, told him be good, told him don't forget your father in heaven, and sent him off. Well, what happened? We all know the story. He spent his money foolishly on wine and women, basically. Lived it up, had a great time, then spent all his money. Then he couldn't make a living after that. And he realized he was happier with his father. He went crawling back to his father, expecting to grovel at his feet. And the father welcomed him back, didn't he? Essentially, that's what America needs to do right now. America is like the prodigal son. We walked away from the Father's laws to teach us how to love one another, how not to hurt one another. And the Father, because He gave us a free will, because He loves us and allows us to make choices in life, allowed us to wander as a nation. Now, as it also was in the book of Jeremiah, you see very clearly that Israel was in trouble. They were oppressing one another, if you read the book. And the father was upset with them and was going to punish them. Lex talionis, eye for an eye. The punishment fits the crime. They were oppressing one another, so they were going to be taken into captivity. Well, what did they want to do instead? They ran off to Egypt looking for military protection from Assyria, didn't they? Not wanting to be punished for their oppressive ways. In other words, they were trying to put a pillow on their backsides because they didn't want the paddling to hurt too badly. They would rather pad the backsides rather than repent, reform, and let go of their slaves. Those of you who know the story, the slaves were let go, but a little bit too late, because then the captivity came anyway, didn't it? Is it too late for us to quit oppressing one another so that the Father might look upon us with mercy and stop this onslaught of coming captivity where we are being enslaved in a technological way? Folks, we need to get back to the Bible as a law book. We need to get back to understanding that the Father's laws are perfect. The law of Yahweh is perfect. Read Psalm 19. It's clear, folks. The Father's law is perfect. Man's laws always, always, every historic attempt of man trying to write good laws always, even though they start out with good intentions, they always end up slowly becoming tyrannical, don't they? It's because there's no enforcement power behind them. And are you ready for this? And there's no real respect for a wholesome lawgiver. Everybody wants to gradually and slowly change the laws to fit their sins of choice. Folks, they taught us evolution to get us away from that God. They taught us that the law was dead in the churches to get us away from the authority of that God. They sent Jesuits into all the churches to corrupt us. They sent the churches into something called the 501c3 tax exemption status, which takes the authority of the Messiah out of the church and gives the authority and possession to the state, not Messiah. Folks, we have to come out from among them both ways, not just church side, but also state side. There's no such thing as separation of church and state. That was a lie as well. When you correct all the lies and you realize how far we have been pushed into a trap, we've been deceived. We weren't diligent. We weren't keeping our eyes open. We've fallen into the pit, into the snare. Luke 21, 35. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. We've been trapped, folks. We've been trapped. And like it says in Jeremiah 50, verse 7, where the elite will present their defense on judgment day, that they didn't force us into oppression. 
and I'm paraphrasing, we didn't do anything. We have no offense. They sinned against their own God. We voluntarily signed into this system. And just as scripture shows in many ways, if you've been persuaded to be yoked to the Father's nemesis system as a faithful citizen of this world's many ties that bind, then we have willingly sold ourselves as indentured servants, as bond servants, as slaves to the beast system. We're then lawfully under Yahweh's law and legally under Satan's agent's law, you are thereby an officially covenanted servant and ambassador for that kingdom and will be expected to uphold that kingdom's precepts. Those who have cut all such ties and have been bought with a price are again a possession of the Savior, where Satan knows not to touch Yahweh's anointed or their inheritance. But as it stands with billions today who have been deceived away from the reality of the spirit realm and Yahweh's word of warning, such souls are yet considered indentured servants, willful slaves, where the slaveholders can do as they see fit with you. And because we can't serve two masters, one master then has to be left out in the cold, where this neglected king of kings is justified in saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, as he's always yet patiently waiting to be let into our lives and nation again. And every time we do something like beg or plead the court to allow us to be a part of some program, you sign an application, you are appealing to the court system, you're applying to Caesar's system to be married, you're seeking his permission, his blessings to allow you to do the simple things that we used to be given responsibilities to do, things like the institution of marriage. These used to be things blessed by the Father. Now we go to Caesar for blessings. Every time you go to Caesar for blessings on whether you're allowed to use Caesar's roads or get married in his courts, you're seeking his blessings. Every time you vote, you are voting for one of Caesar's people. They put up two very wicked people. You're to vote for the lesser of the two evils in a deceptive way, rather than just simply say, no, I'd rather just stay out of your system altogether. I am trusting that my Savior's coming someday and he's going to set up a kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we're trying to do now. Again, some people think that we have to wait for the Messiah to arrive to do this. Well, how did the Puritans do it? The Messiah didn't arrive back during the 1620s. How did the Puritans manage to do it? And then hold on to it for 150 years at least. Folks, the Waldenses, the Albigenses, Israel before Samuel, they were all following a biblical law system. It can be done again. Almost every nation on this planet has proven that they've given up on the Father in Heaven and some form of Biblical Christianity as their law system. There are a few that are standing for the truth of the Bible, but even some of them still have their own bylaws as secondary documents. We need to get back to the Bible, period. It's time for the saints, those of us who truly trust him, who truly realize that law system is perfect. It's time for us to just start realizing he is the great lawgiver. There's no man wiser, more intelligent, more fair, more just, or even more loving than our father and his son. No one more qualified to legislate rules or laws than our father in heaven. Why do we keep looking to the politics? Why? Because we've been tricked into it. We've gotten used to it. Just like the Israelites got used to the golden calf law system in Egypt and couldn't let go of it once they were freed. It's time to get back to that Bible, folks. It's time to create a throne for our Savior. Put it all in place where maybe if he sees we all really want him back, even if just in this nation, perhaps he might come back for us in a way we've never seen before. Folks, I want to thank you for hearing us out. I hope that we've been able to open some eyes, and I pray that you'll join with us and help us spread this truth that has been hidden from us for hundreds of years. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, Yahweh, 
To Him be all the glory. Hallelujah. The love.